welcome everybody to Talk BD. Um, I'm Erin Mahalik, uh, director of the Crest BD Network in Canada. I'm joining you today from Hoi Sound, which is the original name of Roberts Creek on the Sunshine Coast of British, Colum uh, British Columbia, home originally of the, and now of the Coast Salish people. Um, it's my pleasure to invite you and welcome you to, I really can't believe it, it's our 10th Talk BD um, event of 2020. It's our penultimate one of the year. And today we're focusing on exercise for youth with bipolar disorder. For those of you who are new to these events, uh, CRESPD is a uh, group uh, funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research in Canada, dedicated uh, to advancing research into bipolar disorders, specifically community engaged research that is uh, done hand in hand with people who live with the condition. Um, welcome to all of you joining us on Zoom or live streaming through uh, Facebook. Um, as usual with these events, um, we build them to be as intimate as possible. Um, we'll therefore be fairly PowerPoint light uh, through the actual event itself. Um, periodically, though, we'll be dropping a link to a resources document um, into the chat box on Facebook or on Zoom, um, and uh, you'll be getting links to all the resources that we're talking about um, during the initial portion of the event at that point. Uh, regarding questions and answers, uh, thank you to everybody who's already um, provided us with questions through um, our event um, survey before the event. Uh, we'll be beginning with those. Um, you can also, um, during the talk or at the end, drop them into the anonymous Q&A box or Zoom or submit them directly through Facebook. As usual, however, we won't be taking any questions by audio. Okay, so with that little bit of um, housekeeping, we're gonna start with some introductions to our speakers today, uh, Benjamin Goldstein and Tara Armel. And uh, as we do with all of our speakers, I'm gonna ask both of you to tell us a little bit about, you know, what you do for work, uh, a little bit about what you also do for play though, perhaps um, contextualizing this within COVID, maybe you can share one of the things that you've been doing uh, this year to maintain life quality, work-life balance and doing just for yourself. It's nothing to do with your work lives. Um, ben, let's start with you. Okay, so work-wise, thanks Aaron, first of all, for inviting us to this. This is great to be involved on Talk BD and Crest BD, and hopefully uh, just another step in our continued collaboration. I'm a psychiatrist and a clinician scientist in Toronto, and I focus on youth with bipolar disorder, in particular, their link between bipolar disorder and, and physical health. And so on that note, my, my personal anecdote is that uh, I've lived where I live for the past two years, but have not explored much in terms of the surrounding trails. And during COVID, I found that, um, you know, a solid hour, hour and a half walk through these trails, with a little bit of music is uh, a very centering experience that uh, bolsters the day. So that's been my go-to. Ben, do you have creatures on your trails? Do you have, in BC, we would be thinking maybe about bobcat or cougars or bears, or what's your most exotic creature that you've met on the trails? Uh, I've had two encounters with dogs that were uh, just a bit too excited to meet me. And then we had one time where the trails were closed due to coyote sightings. Did you actually see one or just? Uh, no, when I saw the coyote sign, I just kept on walking on the paved road. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Tara. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm really excited to be here. So my name's Tara. I'm a fifth year life sciences student at Queen's University. Um, so the Center for Youth Bipolar Disorder with Dr. Goldstein and his team was my first introduction to mental health advocacy and research. And I've been involved with them for almost five years now. Um, I've also since gotten involved with many different youth mental health organizations, both on Queen's campus and nationally, and I currently serve as one of the presidents for the Jack.org Queen's chapter. So I guess getting back to the question about COVID, um, I'm definitely also trying to get outside for walks, but the, the only creatures I'm really seeing are my four younger siblings. So I don't think that I have <laughs> not seen too many other creatures beyond that. Um, I'm really just trying to keep things simple during COVID, stay involved with the things that I'm passionate about, um, specifically mental health advocacy, trying to have at least one social interaction a day, 
getting outside for walks and just kind of planning little things to look forward to. So you're the oldest of five, is that right? I am the oldest of five. And uh, do you think any of your siblings are watching this or will be afterwards? And how will they feel about you referring to them as creatures? <laughs> I, that's a very good question. I think it would be fairly expected. I don't think it's that uncommon. I'm probably specifically referring to the youngest two, Sammy and Daniel, who just turned 10. So I definitely think that creatures is fairly appropriate for them in, in a loving way, of course. I mean, I'm the oldest of three, I agree. <laughs> nice <laughs> intro, Tara, thank you. I know you have spent some time thinking about the key points that you'd like to share. So I'm just gonna pass it over to the two of you. Thanks, Erin. So, you know, it's great to hear this is the 10th such event for you guys. For us, it's really the first video event that's related to our work together. Um, so it's exciting from a number of counts, but I just thought I'd give first a bit of an overarching view of uh, what it is that we've gathered to talk about, with, which is exercise. And the background for that, as you heard from Aaron about CIHR and funding Crest BD, is that we were fortunate to have the support of Brain Canada to examine a topic that I think somewhat shop shockingly has not been examined before. So you look at the intersection of exercise with bipolar disorder, you'd think that there are dozens of studies that focus on this. In fact, there aren't. And so this study gives us an opportunity to develop a personalized specific approach to helping youth with bipolar disorder make the daily decisions needed to get more physically fit. And um, it's what's called a multi-investigator research initiative, which brings us together with Dr. Michalak's group, Dr. Faulkner also at UBC, um, Dr. McCrindle at Sick Kids, and Tara, um, which is a great opportunity for us to, for the first time, formalize the participation of an individual with lived experience as an active leader within the program. So that's the background for this. And one of the things that I just anticipate in terms of question is why focus on what we call cardiorespiratory or aerobic fitness. And the answer to that is that, you know, if you look at most of the research and the discourse around exercise and bipolar disorder, so much of it focuses on obesity and weight loss. And really there's a lot of benefits to be made from cardiorespiratory exercise or lots of types of physical activity, independent of whether somebody loses weight or not. So we really wanted to offer a fresh, optimistic, uh, realistic perspective on exercise because in fact, it's the people that are the most unfit or the least exercise inclined that have the most to gain from even small changes uh, in their physical activity. So that's the background for our conversation. And with that, I wanted to um, invite a little interview with Tara. So we're gonna go back and forth a little bit. So Tara, could you give us a, a little bit more of a background on yourself before we turn to the questions? Yeah, absolutely. I can definitely give you guys a little bit of an idea of a background and about my personal story before we get into some of our other details. So uh, yeah, I always really like to start off any kind of a speech by really just letting everyone in the audience know that I am equal parts excited and terrified to be here as my fear of public speaking dates back to my diagnoses of obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety and slight Tourette's in grades three and four. So kind of like to say that I wanna be transparent about the fact that I'm uncomfortable, you know, may tick or stutter a little bit, but even admitting that helps. So growing up, I was always a very self-aware kid and I really knew how to express myself again, which is why I was able to be diagnosed with mental illness at such a young age. So throughout the years, maybe I felt somewhat ashamed while I was being treated, but I didn't feel as though overall my life was too influenced by stigma. So I still continued to see both a psychologist and a psychiatrist all the way up through high school, including doing cognitive behavioral therapy for my OCD in grade 11. However, everything changed for me during my first semester exams of grade 12. So the week before exams, I started undergoing extreme behavior changes and I had many distortions in my perception of reality. I really believe that I discovered the true meaning of happiness and I tried to spread these euphoric beliefs to anyone who would listen. I didn't think that I needed to study for exams, my thoughts were racing and I was barely eating or sleeping. Looking back, you know, everyone around me noticed that I was acting odd, but they just attributed it to normal stress-induced behavior during exams. So after an intense series of events that I have a warped memory of, I ended up in the emergency room. The doctors at the hospital felt as though my onset of symptoms was too quick and too strong to be psychiatric. So they did everything from a CT to check for a brain tumor to a lumbar puncture to check for meningitis. 
it was finally determined that I had a manic episode, which is caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain. However, I had a very sudden onset with no family history, which is actually quite rare. So I was hospitalized for a full month and then I was diagnosed with type one bipolar disorder. So following my diagnosis, I had all of these preconceived notions of what having bipolar disorder would look like, which really just led to massive self stigma and shame and a complete loss of my sense of identity. The physical manifestation of my manic episode was similar to a severe concussion due to the chemical imbalance. So I went down to two courses with extreme accommodations and I had significant cognitive deficits. Overall though, I really felt like my new diagnosis had placed me in a box. I was scared of stereotypes and that I'd no longer have control over my life or how I was viewed by others. The shame and fear took over my life for a really long time because I didn't know what to tell all of the many people who clearly knew that I'd been in the hospital and not in school for a month. My immediate family was my safe place during this time because they were the only people I didn't have to put on an act around. However, I actually did not tell my extended family about my hospitalization or diagnosis until years later. My parents wanted to respect my privacy and wishes, which I appreciated. However, looking back, it honestly did lead to more feelings of shame around people that would have supported me if I gave them the opportunity to. So in general, I try really hard to be open about my story and to be honest with myself and my supports when I'm struggling. So when I'm not doing well, I find it very easy to kind of lose all sense of perspective and my mind is taken over by negative thoughts. It's at this point where I no longer have faith in my abilities or my relationships with friends and family. And my pattern is that I unintentionally isolate myself and you know, convince myself that this episode is worse than anything I've experienced before. So now when I notice this happening, I really fight the urge to push people away and tell my loved ones how I'm feeling instead. It can be hard to just blindly believe that things will get better. And so I believe that it's important to look at both past challenges and triumphs as proof that you can overcome anything. I also find that the more I understand my own mental health and how to best take care of myself, the more I can recognize signs and symptoms in others and connect them to help as well. So I always say that to this day, my biggest fear with sharing my story is that people will confuse instances of me being human as a symptom of my bipolar disorder. My diagnosis comes from a very clear psychotic manic episode followed by some severe depressive episodes, and these are not mood swings. Generally, any day-to-day -day moodiness, you know, frustrations or irritations, small fights with friends and family are simply a result of my condition of being human. So I really do believe that my true recovery only started when I was able to be transferred to the Center for Youth Bipolar Disorder. Both my team there and my loved ones were able to convince me that I was still the same person and that I'd be able to get back to the same level of functionality. And this was also where I learned that it's okay to lean on others when you can't see a future that extends past how you currently feel. And I'm very, very grateful for all the opportunities I've had to get involved with the center as they've really helped give me purpose and kind of give meaning to my experiences. Getting involved with mental health organizations and universities has also completely changed my life. Fighting the stigma and just being able to have open conversations with like-minded people has really helped me normalize these topics, in turn, making it easier for me to open up to my own family and friends. So with all of this in mind, I'm just really thrilled to be here today to help continue these conversations. Thanks so much, Tara, for sharing that really candid perspective and allowing people a glimpse as to who you are as a real person, as well as a person with lived experience on exercise, which is the topic we're talking about today. So my first question is, can you tell us a little bit about um, what exercise offers you and how have you integrated it into your life? Yeah, absolutely. Really great question. Um, so I believe that exercise is really my number one tool for regulating my mental health and well-being. If I notice that I'm struggling and I'm trying to figure out what may be going on with my protective factors, the first thing I do is kind of consult my notes to try to determine the last time that I exercised. So I really believe that it can be very hard to almost describe the mental exhaustion that can exist when I'm experiencing heightened mood and anxiety symptoms and maybe when my other strategies aren't working effectively. So at times like this, when I don't feel as in control of my thoughts and my feelings as I would like, there's really nothing more revitalizing than the rush I get from exercising and sweating and just being able to clear my head. 
So this provides a just freedom from my symptoms and honestly a breath of fresh air in a way that no other self-care method really provides. So um, for me personally, I think you asked, I generally try to exercise two to three times a week, often with a mix of weight training and cardio. And I schedule this exercise into my routine, like any other mandatory class or meeting, because I know if I'm not deliberate about it, it's just not going to happen. Um, however, I actually have been dealing with some musculoskeletal injuries lately, which have really dampened my ability to exercise the way that I'm used to. So I've tried to supplement this by just moving my body in any way that I can, namely going for walks outside. And I'm sure as we all know, with COVID, it's easy to sometimes have days where you don't necessarily leave the house, which can also have negative impacts on mood itself. So this really just reinforces the importance of trying to get outside and move my body. Thanks, Terry. You know, you flagged a couple of barriers to exercise that lots of people experience injury or COVID, which affects all of us. What other barriers have you experienced that are not generalized to everybody that may be related to bipolar disorder and how have you gone about overcoming those barriers to exercise? Yeah, another good question. I mean, when I, I almost think of that question in a few different ways, one, or maybe barriers more specific to myself and then others uh, barriers in a bit of a broader sense. So um, I think it can be difficult, obviously, for anyone to find the time and motivation to exercise. However, people living with bipolar disorder can experience even more difficulty in terms of motivating themselves to engage in physical activity, especially in the midst of mood episodes or even just small daily tasks can be difficult. So because of this, I really love the idea of kind of prescribing exercise as medicine, as I think that it provides further evidence to patients of really the benefits of incorporating it into their routine and self-care plans. Um, I think from a bit of a broader perspective, both things like socioeconomic status and cultural norms surrounding exercise in various communities can definitely also serve as barriers to exercise. And during COVID, when we are likely bound to our house for a lot of the time, it may be difficult to find equipment or an exercise class, or even if exercise is just not a common activity for the loved ones of a participant, I think that that could make it much more challenging to implement a program. So I think keeping all of this in mind, I really appreciate that the programs that we ran in our study were flexible with a lot of different options that worked for different participants. As I always say that you know, every case of bipolar disorder is different and every self-care regimen is unique. Therefore, I really do not think that we would have been doing our job if we tried to come up with a one size fits all model for helping patients exercise regularly. So I think that we really have to continue to provide a wide variety of resources for many different types and styles of exercise to determine what's best for each individual person. That's great. Thanks, Tara, for your personal comments and also for the reflections on the study in general. I'm just going to pick up on that thread to mention uh, the philosophy of our approach. So the philosophy is that we don't think it's a, a knowledge gap that keeps people with bipolar disorder from exercising. So we'd done a study a couple of years ago and found that 95% of the teens attending our clinic didn't reach the recommended benchmarks for physical activity. And we don't think it's because they don't know that it could potentially be beneficial. We think that there are other barriers. And so we focused on what's called behavior change counseling. So it's actually an intervention based on a form of psychotherapy that helps people resolve their ambivalence and move towards making decisions in their day-to-day -day life that will help them become more aerobically fit. And as I mentioned earlier, there's just so many reasons that that could be beneficial for them, for their mood, for their cognition. Tara mentioned some fogginess, which is common people have either during depression or after psychosis or just from anxiety. And also for their physical health, which we think is important in the here and now and also down the road in the future. So in addition to that backbone of uh, psychosocial treatment, the behavior change counseling, we had some discussion in our team about what other factors in the treatment people would like. And there were some people that thought an exercise coach would be of interest to our participants. Others thought you gotta get family involved, that's gonna be really important. And then still others thought that it would be good to have peer support. And so what we decided was to offer all of the above as a la carte or additional optional modules and people could choose whatever they wanted. And so that was the design of, uh, of the study that we did that uh, Tara is referencing as, uh, as flexible and individualized. So Tara, just to turn back to you in terms of your, could you comment a little bit about from the research participation side and, and research advocacy, 
leadership. Could you comment about what uh, led you to get involved and, um, and what it does for you that keeps you involved? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when I first got involved with the center, I actually served as a participant in a few different research studies that CYBD has run, um, most of which were actually focused around sort of identifying any kind of biomarker for bipolar disorder. So at the time when I was participating in these studies, I was still greatly struggling with self-stigma and coming to terms with my diagnosis. So I really think that one of the most difficult parts of living with mental illness is really the lack of a tangible explanation for what is going on in your body. So it therefore just brought me so much relief and acceptance to be able to participate in these studies and identify elements of my own physiology that could be related to my diagnosis. So because of that, I think that disseminating the results of these studies is an important tool to destigmatize bipolar disorder at both an individual level and at a societal level, really. So, um, sorry, what was the other part of the question? I think about my, yes, about my collaboration. So yeah. I really wanted to get involved as a collaborator in this exercise study because I know how important exercise is to my well-being and how much it can impact my mental health when I personally am unable to exercise. So I really wanted to help find reasonable and effective ways to help other patients fit exercise into their routines in order to maximize both the short-term and the long-term benefits. Thanks so much. I think you know, you've know you given a lot of great perspectives, both your own and also uh, from a broader perspective. And Aaron, with that, I think we can turn it back to you for uh, next steps in the program. Beautiful job, both of you. Thanks. And being very well received, I can see from the questions that are coming in thick and fast already. One of the very early comments we had was around how much the tips you're going to be sharing today and you are sharing today are related to youth specifically with bipolar disorder or could also be carried over to adults with bipolar disorder. How much of this is generic and how much of it is specific to youth? Mm -hmm. So much of it is generic. I would add that I think it's really important to recognize that the decisions we make as adults are often predicted by decisions that are made when you're younger. So to the extent that we can help young people develop exercise as a part of their day-to-day -day life, that sets them up for success in terms of maintaining that into middle age. Um, I think that there's probably a lot of people, perhaps some on the call that can testify to the fact that it's tough to make those shifts uh, when you're 40 and 50 years old and it happens. Um, so that's the specific perspective that we have, which is any advantages that can be gained by helping people become more physically active early in their life has uh, not just here and now, but future potential. Other than that, though, I think a lot of the benefits are very similar in terms of sleep improvements, anxiety improvements, depression improvements, cognition, all of that type of stuff is a life lifespan benefits. Thanks. Tara, were you quite physically active before you had your onset or is it actually something that you've stepped up since your diagnosis? That's a good question. I think that it probably looks fairly similar in terms of frequency, but I think really the difference is my attention to it and my focus on it and really incorporating it as a part of my routine so that I'm able to continue with it even during mood episodes. So I think that maybe the emphasis has changed, but the frequency may be fairly similar. You um. Thanks. You said in, when in your introduction that you actually scheduled it in, that you made it part of your routine. And I'm just wondering if you've got any tips for me on that, because it seems like you're busy. You know, it seems like there's always stuff that can fill those gaps. There's something that seems sometimes more important. So how do you actually prioritize exercise when you've got so much other stuff going on? What works for you? Um, I think the biggest thing is just the attitude and that it's a non-negotiable. And I'm able to. So I, I have to go to class. I have to exercise. It's just it, it's making it. I mean, obviously, easier said than done, and it um, it takes time. And as I said, I'm definitely not um, perfect with this right now in any way because of other uh, physical health issues that I have going on. But I really think that it's about understanding the importance and. I've almost proved to myself many times over if, as I've said, if I'm experiencing a mood episode or experiencing a lot of anxiety, it can often be traced back to the fact that it's been a while since I've exercised. So maybe some of it was just 
trying to have that attitude from the beginning, but I also probably have to learn the hard way a few times of the, the consequences of it on the other side. Yeah, interesting. Thanks for sharing. Okay, let's dive into some of the questions that we've been having. We had a bunch come in um, before this um, talk began. So we'll start with a couple of those and then get into the live ones. One of the ones that came online um, says, I feel that exercise from home or on my own is less helpful than pre-COVID exercise uh, when I was working out with my school team and my friends. How important is the social aspect of exercise? You know, I think that, you know, the answer that I would have to any question like that is it depends on the individual. Um, as Tara said, every different person with bipolar disorder has different experiences. Some may overlap. So there's some people with social anxiety that would find it really rough to exercise in a group and they love exercising on their own. If you're used to participating in team sports and there's that camaraderie and that joy, it makes perfect sense that uh, it wouldn't be the same to uh, do push-ups or whatever it is that you do, um, you know, a tape on, uh, on YouTube or something like that. Um, but I think that the key is when we're answering questions about exercise is figuring out what is rewarding for a given individual and how do we keep on finding that reward. So if for you it's with an individuals, a group of individuals, then finding a way to, to troubleshoot that. Is it going to a public setting where distance can be kept and um, you know we can be conscious of the COVID context? Whatever the case may be, finding a way to get that reward as part of it. I think that the point that Tara made is just uh, really worth emphasizing that exercise is not a treat. It's a part of treatment. And um, it's not like eating a cupcake or buying yourself something special. It, it, and the view that she has taken to making it part of um, self-care, I think is, is a fundamental importance because we often see people that it's the last thing that they'll do because they consider it an indulgence. So this is an hour for me. Well, it, um, it's part of treatment really. And um, I think dissociating it from that sense of it being a treat someone has um, can be helpful too. And if I can just jump on to that, I also think that it's important to recognize that there still are a lot of kind of social alternatives, even within COVID, that there are a lot of live streamed free classes on Instagram or Facebook or a lot of other platforms and you can engage with friends. And I honestly don't know exactly how this works, but I think even with um, Apple watches, there are ways to send friends information or share uh, share that data somehow. So I think that at times like this, we definitely have to get more creative, but I don't think that that means that we're, we're completely out of options for the social component to exercise, especially if that's really important for an individual. Nice addition. Thanks, Tara. I, um, I wonder about the treat thing though, though, Ben. So we know at a group level, um, people with bipolar disorder um, are quite high generally in, in something we call reward sensitivity, which at a basic level is a desire or a drive to work for treats, you know, for rewards that are positive. Um, and uh, for some people I, I work with, the incorporation of some kind of treats into exercise um, is an important element of that. And so um, I don't live with bipolar disorder personally, but for me, uh, something that works is foraging or mushroom hunting, because there is a treat associated with the exercise and being out in the forest, which is about finding mushrooms or something that I'm looking for. Um, and then there are also ways of gamifying treats and exercise too, if you're looking at apps or, um, so I wonder if, the, if either of you had any um, further thoughts on that association or potential relationship between benefits outside of the exercise itself and the incorporation of other kinds of motivators. I think we're talking about um, the same answer, just from different terms. Uh, it's exactly what I was saying about the question around team sports, that it's about the individual's reward and what they find enjoyable to it. Yeah. So if that reward is from uh, competition, great. If it's from socialization, great. Um, I just want to add one more comment about reward, which is one of the things we hear repeatedly is that people with bipolar disorder are frustrated when they exercise because they're anticipating this buzz, this euphoria, um, that they don't always necessarily experienced to the same extent as people without bipolar disorder do, particularly when they're depressed. And so the expectation that I'm gonna go do something good and I'm gonna feel good, uh, and then having that come back, not in the anticipated way, I think it's important to normalize it in the, to the extent that when someone's feeling depressed, there's a blunting, uh, as you said, reward sensitivity to that reward sensitivity. And that applies also to exercise. And so 
I think it's important to build in strategies to have rewards, to choose the things that are specific to that individual, but also not have people set up to say, oh, all you got to do is try it because it's going to feel great and then you're going to love it. Well, what if that doesn't happen? That person's either not going to listen to you again or feel like they're just that much different than everybody else. Nice. Thanks. Tara, anything to add to that before we move on? I, I was all just taking a second to uh, reflect on what Dr. Goldstein uh, just said. It's interesting because generally for me personally, that like reward sense, not necessarily anything like resembling mania, but just being able to like the breath of fresh air and clearing my head. And especially if I'm having a day where I'm feeling like particularly foggy or really feeling the effects of my medication, I generally find it as something that is very rewarding. So I guess that's an important thing that we have to consider about how to really encourage people who may not get that reward or it's sort of um, intermittent reinforcement, I guess that they may not experiencing it at sorry, may not experience it every time and how to keep the motivation going for them is definitely a, an interesting question. If there's one meta message I'm getting from both of you so far, it's about this need for individualized focus, looking very specifically at people's intrinsic motivators and how they're responding to exercise and to really personalize interventions and self-care behaviors in the context of that. Yeah, totally. And I think, you know, one of the questions that comes up a lot is, is running better than something else, weightlifting, yoga, and that sort of thing. And I think we just try to stay away from anything absolutist. What works for someone in a way that's sustainable, that's success. Um, and so we don't want to give people this added rule that it's got to be running or swimming or whatever, the or high intensity interval training versus something more moderate. Um, it's just got to be something that works for that person. If you're exercising, that's a win. That's the win, that's right? right? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I, I completely agree. I mean, there are so many different things out there and a lot of things that are very accessible and don't necessarily require um, equipment and all of that. So what someone personally enjoys, I mean, that that's what doing everything, right. That's what school, what someone's studying work. That's really every um, aspect of life that there's so much more intrinsic motivation when you really love what you're doing. And so I definitely think that we, we have to be conscious that that applies to exercise as well. And I really appreciated your point before, Tara, about the importance of contextualizing this within socioeconomic factors, that exercise can be expensive for some people, some forms are unobtainable and that we really need to think outside of the box of being prescriptive about those types of exercise within a kind of health equity model as well. Absolutely. Thanks. Okay, let's carry on with some questions. Um, so the next one we had was actually around mania and risk of manic episodes or risk of mania um, with exercise um, in particular. I've come across a couple of smaller studies about intense exercise and bipolar disorder. They were qualitative. Do either of you have any opinions on that? Tara, did you have thoughts? Um, I, I honestly don't right off the bat. I'd love to, I'd love to hear what you're thinking because I myself have only ever had that one manic episode. And so I'm definitely not someone who's as susceptible to them. So I'd, I'd love to hear what you've maybe seen in, in clinic and bounce off that. Yeah, fair enough. You know what I would say is theoretically, there is the possibility that anything that's uh, physically vigorous, whether that's an endogenous process, like um, when you have a wedding, when you have uh, any major life event, that can be a trigger of, of mania. Medications can be. And you know, intense exercise could be as well, theoretically. What I'll say is that you don't see a lot of people coming to the emergency department for exercise induced mania. It's just not something you see a lot of. And if you take a good history, I would say that the vast majority of times that you hear of such an association, the mania symptoms, when, when you ask about details, they preceded the exercise. The exercise was a way to discharge all of that energy. Um, but what I would say is if somebody's hypomanic, so they're having early symptoms of it, it's probably best to reserve the exercise for earlier in the day as opposed to later and to just keep an eye on the duration and the intensity of that exercise just to err on the side of caution. And this is really just speculation. So anyone please correct me if I'm wrong because I don't want to make any misstatements here. But I could see when we're talking about motivation 
that more of that motivation to exercise or do some of those things could be present during mania. So I could see Dr. Goldstein, how there's kind of that um, like difficulty distinguishing um, cause and effect because someone who is generally not inclined to exercise at all and like has, yeah, has a lot more difficulties with that. I could see like an increase in frequency and in exercise sort of being accompanied with other, other symptoms of mania. That's a good addition. Thanks. What about time of day and exercise with respect to light exposure? Um, do you ever make any clinical, clinical recommendations for people trying to exercise in the morning earlier so that they can expose themselves to natural daylight earlier in the day as well? I mean, I think it's a, it's a sophisticated question looking at intersectional benefits, if you will. Um, but as you can expect, my answer to the question is going to be, is that something you like doing um, and trying not to build in too many expectations? Um, you know, we have, it's not just with exercise, when, it, when you have uh, discussions about medications with different mechanisms of action, there's a lot of theory about mixing two together. In reality, the theories and the outcomes don't necessarily match. So if getting up early and having light when you exercise works for you, I think that's great. Um, if having a, a moderate exercise session in the evening hours, a couple hours before bedtime to help you settle down works, that's also great. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Um, not answering this question exactly, but jumping back, Dr. Goldstein, to what you were saying about expectations. I think that's something that I really want to touch on almost from a mindfulness perspective, that really just being able to accept if something doesn't go exactly to plan and just really being able to carry forward and make adjustments as necessary, but not being too discouraged when something doesn't happen exactly the way that you want it to. Because the, the more rigid the expectations are, I mean, we're human in general, but also with like, the unpredictability sometimes of, of mood symptoms, I think really just trying to be kind to yourself when you're starting uh, an exercise regimen and being willing to be flexible and adaptable and all of those things are really important to success as well. And I'll, I'll just contextualize that. And the biggest meta message we've heard from the 10 Talk BD events we've held this year have all been around, has been around self-compassion, kindness to yourself, giving yourself a break when things don't go as expected, celebrating the smaller wins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a real resounding theme, especially during uh, COVID times. Yes, absolutely. Celebrating the smaller wins is something that I can't emphasize enough. I mean, it's something that I do a lot in general, but that was one of my main strategies when I first got out of the hospital that every day I'd have to write down even one or two things and they could be incredibly small, but those were a really big deal at that time. So I think all of those messages definitely apply to exercise as well. Okay, carry on with some, with some more questions. Um... This one is about attitudes, really. I have bipolar disorder and I find exercise works for me. However, a couple of my friends with mental illness post and talk about how they know that. They've been told that exercise helps. They're sick of hearing it and they don't want to try, try it. Um, how can you engage with people to have an open mind about their attitudes towards exercise? I mean, I think it starts with the perspective that everybody has challenges exercising, or, or almost everybody does, and to validate that that's a real thing, that um, it's tough to build it into someone's life. Add to that the challenges that for some people it maybe makes them feel lousy. So if you're not used to exercising, um, in fact, you could feel more exhausted than before and you don't have that buzz that everybody else has. So um, there's a question also in the chat about uh, education. And so I'm going to bring the two of them together and say that this is also a part of our intervention, which is psychoeducation around the differences that a diagnosis of bipolar disorder and its treatments brings to the discussion around exercise, medicines, the effect of mood, and those sorts of things. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, in terms of those friends, our strategy that we've taken is try to dissociate exercise from weight loss and obesity and take away that stigma component. If somebody wants to lose weight, I don't judge that. And if they wanna use exercise as a mechanism to do that, that's totally up to them. Uh, I just want them to know that even if they don't lose a single pound, if they participate in aerobic exercise repeatedly, they will get more fit. 
And, um, and to me, that's something that's a bit more of a, a pull than a push uh, message. So that's the strategy that we've taken. Yeah, I, I think that sounds great. I don't have a ton to add, except for the fact that motivating from a, uh, that wasn't a word, a positive place, as opposed to like a shaming or negative place, or this is what you should be doing. And really just having individual interventions, discussing what they've tried so far, what they haven't. It's very possible that they haven't found something that they consider fun or that they consider desirable, or even starting very small, like 10, 15 minutes, like very infrequently. Like I don't think I've ever told myself, even, even if it's um, a time where I'm not as busy, I don't think I've ever said, you're going to work out every day, or like you're going to work out for an hour every time you work out, because then there's just disappointment goes back to expectations again when that isn't fulfilled. So I think starting with very small, like manageable goals and making it something fun and desirable and yeah, seeing what, what has and hasn't worked in the past. Thank you. Now, I know you both said that you don't really want to get into the weeds or the, or the specifics of um, prescriptions, you know, highly rigorous prescriptions about what type, when exercise, but you know, um, we're getting questions on that. So let's go there anyway. These two questions are linked. You know, how much does intensity of exercise ma matter? Can gentle forms of walking work? And then how much time should you be spending exercising a week to actually see a difference? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, it's true that we're, we're talking under the umbrella of cardiorespiratory exercise. So it has to be something that gets your heart rate up. And um, just to give you a benchmark, I don't think that there's any evidence that high intensity interval training is that much better than moderate. The key is sustainability because we don't want 12 weeks of benefit. We want people to change their life for the better. If you wanna look at uh, intensity, 70% of your aerobic max is considered a medium intensity workout. And that means that you will be sweating. You will have difficulty completing full sentences if you're jogging or playing tennis with a friend, but you're unlikely to really be hating what you're doing. Um, whereas high intensity interval training is going to be briefer, uh, more likely to be aversive in a lot of different ways. And for some people who just can't tolerate the boredom of exercise, that's better because they know they can just go wild for four minutes, three times and be getting a lot of benefits from that. For other people, it's just such an uncomfortable experience that it's not worth it and they never wanna get back on whatever machine they were on or uh, whatever track they were going to. Um, but I think that it has to be to some extent uh, heart rate elevation and then aside from that, repetition. Um, in terms of the amount of times people do it, you know, you look at healthy living guidelines in Canada and other countries, you're talking three to four at least times per week, 20 to 30 minutes and increasingly we've seen that there's more flexibility around that. You do 10 minutes at a shot, you do that three times. Um, it doesn't really matter how you break down the minutes. If there's 120 minutes in a week. So looking at those types of benchmarks, I think are helpful to people so that they can build it the way that they want to. Thanks. Tara? Did you want um, to yeah, I think that was very uh, comprehensive. I just think that even if someone isn't able to achieve those benchmarks and that that's not reasonable for them. Um, not, not necessarily speaking from a research perspective, but just from a personal perspective, getting out and moving can never be a bad thing. And especially during COVID, I personally gain a lot of benefit from going on walks, even if I'm not necessarily able to get my heart rate up. So that's definitely a bit of a different perspective from what we're talking about. But if someone is trying to kind of classify good or bad, like that's never a harmful thing to do for your mental health in general, whether it's necessarily like, yeah, hitting the guidelines that we're talking about. Yeah. Couple more questions to round out before we go to some resources and tools. Um, one that we had was from a family member or a caregiver perspective, a parent of uh, somebody, or I think maybe a couple of sons with bipolar disorder type two, who didn't have too much motivation, don't have too much motivation to exercise, what can family members do to help? Tara, did you wanna go first or second or? Um, I, can, I can start, sorry, just gathering my thoughts on that here. Um, I think 
it really goes back to a lot of the same things that we're talking about with kindness, compassion, positive motivation, seeing where their interests lie, what they've done, what they haven't done, just being supportive in general. I think that's the number one thing with with anything. And it can be very frustrating on all parties when things aren't going as planned, whether it's from like mood symptoms or or not. So I think really just sticking to all of these same guidelines and having patience and being flexible and adaptable and reasonable. I think all of those things really will hopefully set people up for success. I agree totally with those comments. And I think that, um, you know, it's rare in a clinical environment to see guilt or criticism uh, serve the intended purpose of getting people motivated, Um, not being sarcastic. You know, you just see people that have tried the best that they can and they get frustrated and they say, well, why aren't you? Or you could do this. You've missed all these opportunities. It just doesn't work. And uh, there was the earlier question about lifespan differences. And I would say that those are accentuated in youth where there's this um, you know, independence from parents, it's of fundamental importance. And already the disease bipolar disorder has put them in a, has put youth in a position of uh, being more dependent on parents to maybe flag symptoms, help them access therapy and that sort of thing. So to add to that, the uninvited guidance around exercise, it's a very delicate topic. At the same time, to leave it unspoken of, I think is, a you know, goes against what it is to be a parent. And so there's a reality that Um, people are going to want to be involved. And so the question is treading that line very carefully. And what I would encourage is persistent uh, provision of opportunity and uh, and not having an emotional reaction to when that opportunity isn't taken. So I'm going for a 10 minute jog. Do you want to join me? I'm going to walk the dogs. Do you want to come with me? Um, You know, you may get a bit of irritability, but it's unlikely to kind of press those nerve points the same way as why aren't you or why don't you? Yeah. I agree. And I don't think that family attitudes about exercise are very different from family attitudes about like almost anything else with, with treatment, which I don't know if people are going to think of that as a good thing or a bad thing. If they're also having trouble with some of those other aspects, but it really has to come from the, the patient and the individual first. And I can almost guarantee you that any, anything that you may be thinking of, why is this not working? Why am I being like this? Why can't I get out of my head? Why can't I do what I've set out to do? Like any of those questions that a family member may be thinking or asking, I can almost guarantee you that the patient is already feeling it, but magnified. So taking that kind of an approach will honestly, probably, at least from my experience, could push them away or sort of reinforce negative things and discouragement that they're already feeling about themselves. I really appreciate both of your responses to that. Um, And I'm going to hold on and probably steal that. What was your phrase, Ben? Persistent provision of opportunity. It's a lovely way of of putting it. We have a last question for Tara because she's very popular um, and it's nothing to do with exercise at all. It's just clearly you have gained a lot of benefit from advocacy, from engaging with mental health organizations. Um, somebody on the line wants to know, how, how do you begin that process? How did you get involved? Yeah, well, that question makes me really happy because it is not an understatement or overstatement by any means to say that it completely changed my life. Um, I think it's really starting small or whatever you're comfortable with. My entire first year of advocacy was just carrying around a lanyard that said jack.org on it because I was not comfortable going to meetings. I was not comfortable even telling anyone that this was something that I'm interested in. I was terrified that I would be found out and discovered and I was really, really scared of it. So I just entered slowly um, and started getting involved at my own pace. I think that COVID has a, actually has a lot of opportunities where people may see barriers. So for example, with, um, with our jack.org chapter, we have member meetings and we've had member meetings for years, but this year with it being online, 
someone can attend a meeting from their bedroom if they don't feel like they can get out of bed. Like you don't necessarily you can have your camera off. You don't have to even go or identify yourself. And so I think that there are a lot of organizations that are doing really, really great work um, online and in ways that can make it almost anonymous or easier for a newcomer to, to join. But I've never experienced any judgment or any adverse effects at all from getting involved. So if it's something that you're even thinking about, I'd highly, highly um, encourage it. And different organizations really have different like policies and, and practices, but I'd, I'd encourage you to explore what's out there with COVID because there, there may be a lot more than you think. Thank you. And Ben, a lot of funders are prioritizing the importance of incorporating lived experience into research um, in new and different ways, including the funder for this project. Am I correct? That's right. Yeah. So, um, you know, this multi investigator research initiative intended to bring in uh, people with lived experience. It was um, a request for applications that aligned with what we wanted to do. So this was the way for us. This is our first experience like this uh, that Tara is participating in. And it just worked so well um, in, in terms of having the conversation. We didn't get into the details, but there was um, discussion groups for the participants that finished the study. They gave feedback. We discussed that with Tara and other collaborators. We all kind of weigh in and it's gonna make a difference in the sense that we're gonna do a future study on this that is based on lessons from this study that's informed by both the successes and, uh, the, and the missed opportunities of this study. And I'd even uh, add on to that by saying that the number one thing that I've learned from mental health advocacy is that it's not advocacy unless all voices are being represented, whether from an intersectional perspective or really looking at it from, uh, from any perspective. And I am someone who has never wanted to speak like outside of the bounds of their experiences. And that's something that we take a lot of pride in in our uh, organization as well. And I think that's just an incredibly powerful part of this model. But even as the patient collaborator, I would never want it to be seen that my voice is gonna be able to represent everyone. So I think that get, just getting as much feedback, feedback and input from as many people as humanly possible and being able to individualize things in, in a way that we've talked so much about is just so important for the success of these projects. That's nicely put, Tara, thanks. Okay, well, I'm conscious of being a good chair and time, so why don't we round out with a few resources and I'll come back to you both for a few uh, closing remarks and reflections at the end. Um, as usual, we've been sharing this document throughout uh, this uh, Talk BD event with you, which has uh, links to the various uh, resources uh, that we've mentioned um, throughout the talk. We didn't get into the details of uh, using physical activity logs. Um, there are two slides describing uh, these here and a number of options available, um, but it might be one concrete resource or tool um, that you might want to consider if you're looking to incorporate more exercise in a routine, routinized manner into your lives. Uh, another tool we can get into either, which is fabulous, is the Exercise and Depression Toolkit. Um, ben mentioned at the beginning of this that Dr. Guy Faulkner has been one of uh, the collaborators on this project. And uh, this is an initiative that's actually developed for healthcare providers to help people with depression specifically, um, developed in collaboration with uh, CANMAT um, and um, is a really um, nice recently produced tool that we encourage you um, to check out. And I think it has utility whether you're a healthcare provider or not with some really concrete actions in there designed for people with um, depression specifically. Um, as uh, always, we'll also point you to a few resources available on our Crest BD um, Bipolar Wellness Center, one of which is um, a video on incorporating exercise into your daily life featuring Victoria Maxwell, who normally participates in these events. Um, our Bipolar Wellness Center also has a section specifically looking at uh, physical activity and exercise in bipolar disorder, which has um, a number of additional concrete resources and tools available for you to peruse at your leisure. And our quality of life tool, which you may be familiar with, um, also helps you track um, the relationship between um, uh, exercise as a life area and your quality of life over time. 
As usual, our academic website is available for you as a resource or a portal for sharing um, news of our publications and other um, events. And you can stay abreast of everything by signing up for the Crest Currents newsletter. And uh, we are now about four weeks into the launch of our newest study, which is looking at the relationship between psilocybin or magic mushroom use in people with bipolar disorder internationally. That's a survey and it will be a sort of, um, also um, uh, include a qualitative component, which is interviews with people who've used psilocybin as a treatment option. So check that out if that's something of interest to you. And as I said at the beginning, this is our penultimate uh, Talk BD event of the year. Our next one will be looking at cognition or memory and thinking and bipolar disorder. And that's gonna be held at 12 o'clock Pacific, three o'clock Eastern, eight o'clock for those of you who join us from the UK. And of course you can also um, access all of the recordings of our previous Talk BD live events through this website link, through the archives on our Facebook page. And um, finally, there will be a little survey that you'll have access to at the end of this, um, talking about uh, three questions for your responses on how you think we're going, how you think we're doing, and what topics you'd like to see us cover. We will be coming back in 2021, so please do give us some information about what else you'd like to cover through these, see us cover through these events. And as thank you, as usual, to our funders, our partners, our research collaborators. And the final couple of slides will just show you, uh, or the final slides will show you where you can keep track of us on social media. So with that, I will pass back to Tara and Ben and just ask if you have any, how did you think it went? Do you have any closing reflections or remarks or anything you'd like to share at the end of this, this time we've had together? Well, look, I'm biased, like from my perspective, I've seen Tara talk a, a bunch of times and each time is just so inspiring. And so I just wanna, um, mention her courage and her the incredible skill she's developed in this. Um, that's the main comment I wanted to make. And I just, before I turn it over to Tara, wanted to um, make one comment, which is that the treatment manual for this study is gonna be publicly available. And in fact, it's a main goal of our project funded by Brain Canada to disseminate this across the country. Once it's complete, we're gonna let uh, Chris BD know and then people can uh, email and get a copy of it. And I wanted to also thank uh, the three social workers that were the therapists on the study. Um, Vanessa Rajamani, Danielle Amrin, and Jessica Roan, as well as Diana Kubeva and Najla Popel, who participated as well as Rhonda Schick with all the testing and the oversight. It was really a team effort and a lot of excitement on behalf of the team when participants would come in and exercise. So that's from my perspective. Well, thank you, Dr. Goldstein, for those very kind words. Um, I guess I just wanted to say that projects and events like this are really an incredible thing to be able to come out of COVID in a way to connect us and yeah just in a way that we likely would not have done under other circumstances and I think that you guys are doing really wonderful work and starting important conversations and I'm very happy that I was able to be a part of it so thank you for having us. <laughs> Really incredible job. Thank you so much, both of you, for sharing your expertise with us. Uh, thank you to everybody on the line. Um, stay safe, stay well, and we'll look forward to catching you again towards the end of November. Goodbye. Bye.